Hello, good evening and welcome everybody back to the Ritchie Auditorium in the Rothenburg Hall. I am so thrilled <laughs> to see all of you here joining us in the brave new, hopefully, post-COVID world. My name is Steve Hindle. I'm Director of Research here at the Huntington, where I convene the Fellowship Programme, the Conference Programme and the Lecture Programme. And it's my pleasure to be your host uh, this evening. This evening's program is the first of three talks related to the most significant loan program in which the Huntington Art Museum has ever been involved. In this case, the loan is reciprocal. While our beloved Blue Boy has traveled to the National Gallery in London, the painting which has come to us in return is no less iconic or important, and some would say even more iconic and important. Joseph Wright's experiment on a bird in the air pump, currently exhibited in a remarkable installation of associated material from our library and art collections in the Huntington Art Gallery. If you haven't seen it yet, please go and see it at your earliest opportunity. It is with us for a few more months. This evening's talk is the Walk Lecture, endowed in honour of the former director of the Huntington Art Collections, Bob Walk, and giving uh, the lecture in Bob's memory is Professor David Salkin, who told me yesterday that the first tour he was ever given of the Huntington was by Bob Walk himself. So it's especially appropriate that he's here with us this evening. David Salkin is the Emeritus Professor of the History of Art at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London, where he taught from 1986 until his retirement. He holds his first degree from Harvard, his MA from the Courtauld, and his PhD in the History of Art from Yale. He's held fellowships from the Social Sciences Research Council of Canada, the Leverhulme Trust in the UK on two occasions, including an extremely prestigious major research fellowship from the Leverhulme and from the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art. In 2012, he was elected a fellow of the British Academy, the highest honor that can be bestowed on a humanities scholar in the United Kingdom. A world-renowned authority on the history of British art, David is the author of Richard Wilson, The Landscape of Reaction, 1982, Painting for Money, The Visual Arts and the Public Sphere in 18th Century England, 1993, Painting Out of the Ordinary, Modernity and the Art of Everyday Life in Early 19th Century Britain, 2008, Turner and the Masters, 2009, and most recently, Art in Britain, 1660, to 1815, which appeared in 2015 in the Penguin series. David was also the guest curator of the exhibition Art on the Line, the Royal Academy exhibitions at Somerset House, which took place at the Courtauld in 2001 to 2. He also edited and co-authored the collection of essays that accompanied that exhibition, for which he was awarded the inaugural Berger Prize for British Art History. To rehearse a conversation with ourselves, right of Derby's air pump as a modern moral subject, please welcome the 21 to 22 Walk Lecturer in Art History, Professor David Salkin. <laughs> I told you it was a long walk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have escaped Plague Island, as I think of it, uh, and to have come to this beautiful part of the world. Apart from a small number of works of his own creation, Joseph Wright's experiment on a bird in the air pump looks like no other picture in the history of British art. And although it belongs to the European tradition of candlelight painting associated with the early 17th century Italian master Caravaggio and his followers, the subject matter and the dramatis personae of the air pump set it apart from that heritage as well. The exceptional aspects of its appearance have prompted scholars to try and situate the image in other non-artistic contexts of the history of science, or of the Enlightenment culture distinctive to the middle classes of the English Midlands. But while these and other paths may be well worth exploring, I'm rather wary of pursuing any avenue that may encourage us 
to regard this extraordinarily sophisticated image as a provincial oddity or as in any way marginal to the mainstream of 18th century British visual culture. Of all the issues that artists and art theorists confronted in this period, arguably none received more serious attention than the role that pictures could play as instruments of moral improvement. There was a general understanding that figurative art could serve the purposes of inculcating virtue in one of two basic ways either by providing viewers with depictions of exemplary human behavior designed to inspire emulation, or by confronting audiences with images of transgressive conduct in the hopes of encouraging, to do, encouraging them to do the opposite. The first of these tasks was most commonly associated with history painting, which stood on the highest level of the academic hierarchy of pictorial genres or types. The second, with the low genre of graphic satire. One of the things I'm going to show you tonight is, that, is how Wright's air pump engages with these two antithetical but complementary traditions, how it draws elements from both heritages and from other picture types as well. For a contemporary audience, the air pump's remarkable size would have acted as an initial unmissable signal of its claim to the elevated status of historical art. In fact, there was no larger canvas on display at London's Society of Artists exhibition in 1768 where Wright's picture made its public debut. Here, one of the very few other canvases on a comparable scale was a grip and a landing at Brundisium with the ashes of Germanicus, a history painting of a far more conventional sort by the American-born Benjamin West. A comparison of these two works tells us that it was not just its impressive dimensions that the air pump shared with the most prestigious form of narrative art the ancestry of which could be traced back from West to Nicholas Poussin and the Renaissance master Raphael, and even further back to the relief sculpture of Greek and Roman antiquity. When Wright, as you can see, balanced a group of figures around a central dramatic action, like West, he was adhering to a standard compositional formula often referred to as the circle of response that academic history painters had used for centuries. Another more specific indicator of his high level of ambition can be found in the figure of the older girl, Wright, whose face is concealed by her hand. As you can see, a similar motif meant to signal inexpressible grief also features in West's Agrippina. In both cases, we are dealing with a quotation of impeccable provenance, dignified not just by its allusion to much admired figure in the lower right of Poussin's death of Germanicus, but also by its derivation from a renowned lost masterpiece of ancient art, The Sacrifice of Iphigenia by Timanthes. An ancient authority of no less standing than Pliny the Elder had claimed that the Greek painter had chosen this pose, has invented this pose, because the profound sorrow could only be suggested and never depicted. Presumably right, like Poussin, like West, had much the same idea in mind. And by endowing his air pump with the characteristic trappings of historical art, he tied his picture to the most noble ethical purpose that painting was then thought capable of fulfilling. That is, to provide images of exemplary behavior that would inspire viewers to pursue the highest standards of virtue 
in the conduct of their own lives. Now, this moral reading of history painting had been most influentially introduced to an English-speaking readership by the politician cum philosopher Anthony Ashley Cooper, third Earl of Shaftesbury, in the early 1700s. Shaftesbury's key contribution to British art theory was a treatise on the judgment of Hercules, which was illustrated by an engraving after a painting by the Neapolitan artist Paolo de Matteis that the Earl himself had designed and commissioned uh, to give concrete form to his ideas. Very briefly, this shows the renowned hero of classical mythology, Hercules, standing at the crossroads between figures emblematic of virtue on the left and vice on the right. Both the treatise and the image make it clear that Hercules has already decided to resist the pleasurable allure of vice in favor of taking the difficult upward path indicated by virtue. So it's going up. That's his destination up there. In so doing, he will rise above his private, selfish interests to embrace the common public good, just as the artist himself, the painter, has ignored or risen above the particular forms of actual observable nature in favor of a classical idealizing style which is dedicated to conveying general, universal truths. Shaftesbury was firmly convinced that the only viewers capable of grasping a point, the point of such an image and of emulating Hercules' example of comprehensive wisdom and purely disinterested behavior, that the only viewers capable of doing this were wealthy male landowners like himself. For him, this exclusive group constituted the only public truly worthy of the name. But it wasn't long before other writers embarked upon the task of modifying uh, Shaftesbury's ideas to accommodate a growing constituency of middle class men and women who felt themselves no less deserving of a high visual culture that spoke for their own interests and values. Among Shaftesbury's numerous followers who devoted themselves to defining the forms that just such an imagery might take, it is a Scottish theologian by the name of George Turnbull who takes us closest, I think, to understanding the intellectual premises underlying Wright's experiment on a bird in the air pump. Turnbull's main contribution to British aesthetic discourse is a, bush, a book he published in 1740 rather misleadingly entitled, A Treatise on Ancient Painting. I say it's misleading because the scope of his study extends far beyond the evidence of painting in ancient Greece and Rome to encompass the modern Italian and French schools and to pre prescribe a set of guidelines for the art more generally. Like his mentor, the Earl of Shaftesbury, and in line with academic theorists from the Renaissance onwards, Turnbull's focus is on the class of pictorial imagery depicting heroic actions in the universal language of classical idealism. That is to say, on what we call history painting, uh, although his preferred term is moral pictures, like the two examples uh, by Raphael and Poussin that I show you here. The fundamental purpose of such works, he explains, is, and I quote, to show us to ourselves, to reflect our image upon us in order to attract our attention the more closely to it and to engage us in conversation with ourselves and an accurate consideration of our make and frame. What Turnbull means by this statement, which has given me the sort of the overall heading for, the, uh, for this, this talk tonight, and this is where his theological bias comes into play, 
is that a truly moral picture will encourage its spectators to contemplate their place in the great chain of being that ascends from inanimate nature upwards to the all-seeing and all-knowing God. A conversation with ourselves could have no higher aim. Now, according to the treatise, Turnbull's treatise, history painting can fulfill the aims of this philosophical and implicitly Christian program by representing heroes who embody the most noble qualities of human nature and whose actions may serve as templates for emulation. Though Turnbull never introduces the possibility of choosing such exemplary individuals from the present day, he opens the door to a development precisely of that sort by modifying Shaftesbury's art theory in two significant ways. Firstly, by allowing for the inclusion of what he calls accidental features, such as period costume, even if he feels that the artist's overriding commitment should be to the portrayal of ideal and general forms. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, while Shaftesbury confines the scope of exemplary human conduct to the public virtues that, that, that accompany the performance of heroism, that, accompanies, uh, that, that motivates self-sacrifice to the common good, Turnbull, Turnbull encourages painters also to consider whatever subject matter as he says, calls into action are generous, tender, and kind affections. It is those fictions or representations, he goes on to say, which excite our social affections and call forth generous sentiments that yield us the highest and most satisfactory and lasting entertainment. George Turnbull's endorsement of a modified version of history painting is symptomatic of what cultural historians have called the domestication of virtue, a broad trend of great significance in 18th century British literature and the visual arts. William Hogarth's Moses brought before Pharaoh's daughter, or Edward Penny's The Marquis of Granby relieving a sick soldier, these are only two of many examples one could find of works from the mid-1700s that were designed, as I say, to, to, to paraphrase Turnbull, to excite our social affections and call forth generous sentiments. And that in so doing, celebrated the virtues of a subjectivity uh, grounded in the circumstances of private life. One important catalyst for efforts to modify the traditional form of moral picture was the establishment of new public spaces for the display of modern painting. It's no coincidence that Hogarth produced his Moses for the great courtroom of London's Foundling Hospital, which largely, largely thanks to his, his initiative became the capital's first public art gallery. By the same token, the creation of a crowd-pleasing picture like Penny's Marcus of Granby is almost, imaginable, is almost unimaginable outside the context of England's first regular art exhibitions, which had begun welcoming crowds of visitors annually from 1760 onwards, uh, charging them the modest fee of a shilling per head. Here, thousands of middle-class Britons, women as well as men, were given numerous opportunities to see themselves, or at any, or any rate, people like themselves, in the portraits that always dominated the walls. But there was widespread agreement that as a genre that imitated particular appearances and that catered to vanity and self-interest, that the popularity of portraiture reflected badly on the society that produced it. 
greater dignity could be and was attached to works like Penny's Marks of Granby or his death of General Wolfe, which blended the specifics of portraiture with the compositional and thematic conventions of historical art. The contemporaneity and the patriotic content of pictures like these, uh, 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 which uh, were just two of the elements that made them accessible to middle class audiences. And uh, although no less important was the value that scenes like these placed on non-heroic social virtues. In this, these instances on the left, charity uh, directed at the deserving poor or uh, sympathy for the dying. But history painting, even in this modern sentimentalized form that came to the fore in the 1760s and beyond, history painting can only offer ordinary viewers a rather distorted or mediated reflection of themselves, an image refracted through an old lens that focused on the portrayal of heroic public figures like these two military commanders, the portrayal of higher authorities as opposed to conversational equals. When Joseph Wright entered the arena of the London exhibitions in the mid-1760s, he embraced the challenge of the modern moral picture, but in a manner that distinguished him from any of his rivals. Though he took the tradition of history painting as one of his starting points, he also drew upon the formal structures of large-scale group portraiture as the basis for a new type of subject picture designed quite specifically with the broad constituency of exhibition goers in mind. For them, he would devise an affirmative representation of the immediately contemporary world, of a, of a society given a comprehensible shape and moral character by a network of interactions of private individuals and between those individuals and the cultural commodities which they acquired through the marketplace. If here virtue could not be found parading in the single person of the active hero, its presence could be re rediscovered in the ensemble of refined viewers engaged in the collective pursuit of knowledge. On his London debut, his first time he, he, he showed his works in public in 1765, Wright introduced the Capitals art lovers to the kind of painter that he had been and to the kind that he was now determined to become. The picture that looked backwards, the more conventional of these two exhibits, was a family portrait, almost certainly the group of James and Mary Shuttleworth and their daughter that you see now on the screen. That this was a tour de force of Mimetic skill, I think, hardly needs pointing out when it came to depicting the forms and textures of fashionable fabrics. I think this is just remarkable here. Uh, the reflective sheen of a polished table or the soft delicacy of a bird's plumage, Wright's mastery could hardly have been surpassed. His ability to produce highly individualized likenesses must have been equally evident, especially to viewers accustomed to the more idealized physiognomies uh, crafted by Joshua Reynolds, then the dominant player in the contemporary portrait market. This same juxtaposition all, also highlights an important feature that had come to be characteristic of British group portraits by the mid 18th century, that is, the inclusion of a, an interactive element that brought large-scale pictures such as the Wright and the Reynolds into the orbit of the smaller uh, conversation piece tradition, just uh, typified by the Francis Heyman that I'm now added to the mix. Conversation. In British moral discourse, going back 
at least as far as Joseph Addison's and Richard Steele's Tatler and Spectator essays of the early 1700s, conversation had been prized as a central engine in the production of a civilized society. Social commerce, as it was sometimes defined, not only enabled the dissemination of knowledge and opinions, it was also believed to play a crucial role in refining the human passions into manners and to create bonds of sympathy between its different participants. These ideas formed the subtext of the other far more novel and eye-catching conversation that Wright exhibited in 1765, this four-foot-wide horizontal canvas uh, bearing the rather prosaic title, Three Viewers Viewing, Three Persons Viewing the Gladiator by Candlelight. Now, in case there are a few of you who don't recognize the object in the center, uh, as Wright assumed his audience would, uh, let me tell you that it's a reduced cast, plaster cast of the Borghese gladiator, uh, which in the 18th century was regarded as one of the greatest masterpieces of antique sculpture. In London in the 1760s, tabletop reproductions like the one uh, uh, depicted by Wright uh, could be bought for less than two pounds, so well within the buying capacity of members of the uh, middling orders, which is what these three gentlemen appear to be. Their faces have the specificity of portraits, and scholars have more or less persuasively identified the two younger men as the uh, uh, painter himself uh, at right, and then his friend, uh, Peter Perez Burdett, in the center. But to most of the picture's original viewers, they were simply anonymous male persons from the same time, place, and class as themselves. The Gladiator, then, was a modern genre picture, but one endowed with the gravitas of European old master art. What contemporary spectators found most striking were the dramatic tonal contrasts produced by Wright's attempt to render the effects of candlelight on a darkened interior and its occupants, a kind of technical tour de force most commonly associated, associated with the works of Caravaggio and his 17th century Dutch followers. On this occasion, Wright had married a Caravaggesque chiaroscuro with another source that was somewhat closer to home. This is the tradition of portrayals of the sense of sight. In particular, an example produced in England in the mid-1740s by the naturalized Frenchman, Philip Mercier. For Wright, however, the emblematic heritage of senses imagery supplied only the foundation for a much more ambitious edifice. It was not sight per se, but sights and visual arts, instrumental role in the cultivation of understanding and morality that he set out to represent. Now, here I'm presupposing that Wright and his audience took for granted the truth of a set of basic arguments about the working of, workings of the human mind that had been put forward in Britain the better part of a century earlier by the philosopher and physician John Locke. Locke describes sight as, and I quote, the most comprehensive of all our senses, end quote, because it operates as the principal means of supplying the intellect with ideas. These, he says, are then lodged in the brain as in a kind of a storeroom to be compounded in the manufacture of thought. Locke writes that the mind should be compared 
to what he calls, he says, to a closet, wholly shut from light, with only some little openings left to let in external visible resemblances or ideas of things without. Would the pictures coming into a, such a dark room but stay there, it would resemble very much the understanding of man in reference to all objects of sight and the ideas of them. Now, it's tempting and probably not inappropriate to think of Wright's, Joseph Wright's dark rooms in precisely these terms, although I don't think there's any need to be quite so literal. I think it's enough to say that a Lockean philosophical framework underpins all his major candlelight scenes from the 1760s. In their different ways, each of them dramatizes what the painter and his contemporaries took to be a central truth about the human experience, that light enables sight, and sight, in turn, enables enlightenment. In the case of the gladiator, it's the pleasure of viewing a masterpiece of human creation that gives rise to knowledge and that allows modern civilized values to triumph over the barbarities of antiquity as, as personified by the statue of the gladiator. In the case of the orrery, Wright's next exhibited candlelight, it is the beauty of God's creation that a mixed audience of lay people, adults and children, have gathered to admire by attending to a philosopher's demonstration of a mechanical model of the solar system. They are probably being shown the workings of an eclipse. In a more general sense, however, they are absorbing, absorbing a lesson about the operation of the universe based on Newton's theory of gravitation. An elucidation of natural law also dominates the air pump, though its theme is considerably more complex. Here, Wright has depicted a natural philosopher, who we call a scientist, teaching a, familiar, a fashionable audience about the necessity of air to life by showing them and showing us a white cockatoo struggling for breath in the partial vacuum that has been created within the glass receiver or jar at the top of the pump. It is the climactic moment of the experiment when the bird may die or when the lecturer may restore it to health by opening the stopcock that he grasps between the fingertips of his left hand. The suspense is heightened by the theatrical chiaroscuro, which highlights the reactions of the spectators, ranging from the evident distress of the two young girls through to the calmer responses and apparent unconcern displayed by the other members of the group. By introducing an element of action, the air pump takes on more of the character of a narrative painting, and in so doing, it raises certain moral questions that neither the gladiator nor the orrery brings into play. Now, I doubt when, whether anyone here this evening is unaware of the controversies that have long been attached to experiments involving animals. Anxieties about the justifiability of such practices were certainly shared by 18th century English men and women, as we shall see later on. But first of all, I think we need to appreciate that the same people made much less of a distinction between science and ethics than most of us nowadays tend to do. To introduce us to their different way of thinking, I want once again to use Turnbull's treatise on ancient painting as our guide, because this not only addresses the relationship between what was then called natural and moral philosophy, 
but because it also considers the implications for painting in a way that strikes me as uniquely helpful for an understanding of the form and content of Wright's air pump. In his analysis of the highest purposes of art, Turnbull takes his starting point from Shaftesbury's contention that painting should contribute to the ethical instruction and improvement of humankind by giving concrete form to abstract notions of morality. Both writers, that is to say, argue for a close alliance between visual arts and moral philosophy. But in what is a significant, highly significant departure from Shaftesbury's point of view, Turnbull insists that attempts to separate natural philosophy from its moral counterpart are fundamentally misguided. On the contrary, he insists both aspects of philosophy should be, and I quote, should be managed and carried on in the same way of experiment. And in the one case, as well as the other, nothing ought to be admitted as fact till it is clearly found to be such from unexceptionable experience and observation. So moral truths, as well as natural truths, have to be, their, their, their truthfulness is proven by uh, 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 experience and observation. Turnbull firmly believes, moreover, that conclusions derived from moral powers and affections can, affections can only help to improve human morality if the laws of nature as perceived by our senses are also taken into account. So it's with this conjunction in mind of what is understood through thought, through moral thought, and seen through our eyes, that, painting define, that Turnbull defines painting as a form of cultural expression that is uniquely equipped to marshal the conjoined resources of moral and natural philosophy for the advancement of human understanding. Certain pictures may be primarily moral, he suggests, and others primarily natural. But even those that fall into the second category, such as landscapes, he says, are bound to promote an awareness of the moral ends or final causes of effects that are manifest in the physical world. In a passage that implicitly invokes the authority of Isaac Newton, Turnbull writes that pictures which represent visible beauties or the effects of nature in the visible world by the different modification of light and colors in consequence of the laws which relate to light are samples of what th these laws do or may produce. And therefore, they are proper samples and experiments to help and assist us in the study of those laws, as any samples or experiments in the study of the laws of gravity, elasticity, or any other quality in the natural world. These pictures then, he says, these are then samples or experiments in natural philosophy. Likewise, good moral paintings, by which phrase Turnbull means history paintings, can serve as proper samples in moral philosophy and ought therefore to be used in teaching it for the same reason that experiments are made use of in teaching natural philosophy. Yet only if they remain true to the laws of nature can moral pictures teach men about themselves, the perceptible world, and the divinity responsible for all of creation. This condition, this proviso, leads Turnbull to abandon the strict insistence on ideal form that was one of the central articles of faith of classical art theory. Citing a statement attributed to Socrates, he claims that a, that a picture must be a true imitation, a true likeness. Not only the carnation must appear red, but even the stuffs 
silks, and other ornaments in the draperies. Without truth, no imitation can please. And if a work of art gives pleasure in this manner, in so doing, Turnbull says, it will enhance its virtuous effect on the beholder. Provided, that is, that the painter makes a fine and judicious, judicious choice of nature and that he chooses or he, she, she chooses a subject capable of exciting in our minds great and noble ideas of the moral kind. Now, I've never been able to determine, we probably will never be able to determine if Joseph Wright ever read Turnbull's treatise. Though one imagines that a painter who was trained in the particular art of portraiture and who enjoyed extensive contacts with his local sci scientific community would have responded with considerable enthusiasm to what I believe to be the only art theoretical text available to him that actively promoted an alliance between painting and the two main branches of philosophy, and that also sought to validate the sort of descriptive illusionism most commonly associated with the low tradition of Dutch art. But in any case, my aim here is not to argue for a specific relationship, never mind a relationship of dependence, between Wright's imagery and Turnbull's text. Rather, I think that Turnbull has been worth bringing into the picture because his writings introduce us to the same universe of ideas that spawned the orrery and the air pump. Obviously, in each of these, Wright set out to provide his viewers with something more than the straightforward representation of a contemporary scientific demonstration. And it would be entirely in keeping with the spirit of his two scientific candlelights if we were to regard each as a, in Turnbull's words, each as a sample or experiment in natural philosophy, not only by virtue of what is described, but also when the manner of that description is taken into account. When Wright dramatizes the effects of light on color, in part he does so to assist our understanding of Newtonian optics. And when he portrays every object with a startling degree of meticulous illusionism, one point is to enable us to emulate the audience within the painted scene who achieve themselves an awareness of natural truth through close empirical observation. At the same time, the depiction of human actors engaged in the contemplation of natural and divine law must necessarily raise questions that lead into the province of moral philosophy. If the supreme purpose of such philosophy lay in the promotion of self-knowledge, this was a purpose that Wright seems to have embraced in a much more literal sense than Turnbull had had in mind when he spoke about moral pictures engaging us in conversation with ourselves. Instead of depicting some exemplary hero from the classical or Christian past, Wright showed his viewers people they could recognize as belonging to their own world. So, how, how has the painter characterized that world? Well, it may be a bit obvious to say this, but perhaps modern is the first word that springs to mind. When the air pump went on view in 1768, visitors to the Society of Artists encountered an image of emphatically contemporary domestic life on a monumental scale large enough so that they could imagine themselves stepping into the scene and taking up their place at the table, as you can do if you, if you stand in front of the air pump uh, uh, here at the Huntington. With that spectacular piece of polished mahogany furniture, Rococo picture frame in the upper left, the grand neoclassical a doorway, the, 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 the very fancy birdcage, uh, this interior could hardly have been more up to date. 
And apart from the philosopher whose flowing robes and unkempt hair lent him a theatrical character, all the figures are dressed in line with late 1760s trends, perhaps not at the very height of fashion, but fully in accordance with what would have been expected at this time of prosperous middle-class citizens. They inhabit a universe of circulating commodities, of things that have been purchased to satisfy personal desires and to enable a more pleasant life. The most costly of these objects um, was probably the uh, table-mounted uh, air pump, a portable device which uh, uh, at this point had been in existence for about 30 years and had recently been improved by the uh, uh, instrument maker Benjamin Martin. Although the pumping mechanism shown by Wright is broadly consistent with Martin's designs, the large glass receiver on its elevated stand bears a stronger resemblance to the very first air pump invented by Robert Boyle in 1659, and presumably Wright included because it, it, made, it, it, it gave his picture a kind of, of more dramatic focus than if it was just sitting on the table. Um, If scientific instruments were meant to expand the boundaries of human knowledge, they also entered many 18th century homes as part of a thriving trade in luxury goods. Most of the objects and articles of clothing in Wright's scene would have originated in Britain. The two major exceptions being the table, built out of wood imported from the Caribbean, and the white cockatoo a rare and expensive bird from the East Indies. Now, when I get to the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you to consider the implications of these geographical connections. But for the moment, I'd like you to register that it is not just the objects that have come from outside the domestic space that now contains them, but most of the human actors as well. While it's possible that these people have gathered in the residence of the scientific demonstrator whose assistant is shown lowering down or raising up the cage at upper right, a more likely scenario would place the action in the home of the father and two daughters. The reasons why we don't see a mother I'll get to shortly. Most if not all the remaining company appears to consist of friends or relations gathered for the occasion. An even larger network of connections, and in this case of a distinctly commercial sort, is suggested by the presence of an itinerant natural philosopher, presumably one of those traveling salesmen who peddled knowledge together with the tools of his trade. Thus, the things and activities contained within the candlelit space of the air pump presuppose the existence of a complex network of production and exchange involving a countless number of particular and interdependent interests of manufacturers, consumers, and intermediaries. It is this commercial character that defined modern society for Wright and the vast majority of his British contemporaries. The painter's insistence on the individually distinctive character of the people and the objects that he's portrayed implicitly underlines one of the key effects that commercialization, coupled with the attendant division of labor, was generally believed to have on social personality. That is, the explosion of that personality, of that traditionally associated with the public hero, the public uh, man, uh, its explosion into countless human fragments an infinite multiplicity of private, partial points of view. Although they may have come together for the same purpose, all of the players in Wright's intimate drama are shown reacting differently to what has taken place before them. Each of these atomized individuals may aspire to understand the workings of nature, but for them its overall shape remains a mystery 
a darkened cosmos that can only be perceived in discrete bits by means of scientific rituals designed to elucidate certain specific natural laws. The experiment they are observing does not promise to yield anything in the way of new discoveries. All its observers can expect is confirmation of what is already known about the indispensability of air to life. And from that knowledge, they may or they may not then go on to consider broader issues of religion and morality. Wright invites his viewers to take that step themselves by invoking the central human dilemma, the temporal passage from life and into death. If the bird hovers between these two states, its human spectators point to the same inevitability by staging a progression from childhood to old age. The imperative to bring our material existence into the light of spiritual truth is further suggested by the artist's depiction of earthly and heavenly light. Can the candle you can see reflected along the side of the jar and the moon, uh, uh, both of which are glimpsed only partially as if to imply our incomplete knowledge of the supreme and invisible author of enlightenment in both the physical and spiritual senses of that word. It was a commonplace notion in 18th century educational literature that scientific de de demonstrations were meant to stimulate some degree of moral understanding. As the novelist Charlotte Lennox put it in 1760, to the mind of cool and clear reflection, the use of studies in natural philosophy is plain and evident. They lead by smooth and regular gradations to peace and happiness. They raise the thoughts to humanity and devotion. And by, and by a regular transition, they convey our contemplation from the creature to the creator. From observing particular phenomena, those who, involve, who indulged in scientific study as a form of fashionable amusement strove to gain an intimation of universal truths. But those truths could only be glimpsed from beneath, as it were, from the standpoint of individuals with limited interests and experiences of born subjects rather than born rulers. Lennox, in fact, was uh, speaking to an audience of women. To them, she recommended natural philosophy for one reason above all, as a means of directing the, the dangerous feminine passion of curiosity into a safe and rational channel. The air pump would appear to support the commonplace 18th century opinion that women could gain an understanding of natural laws only if male partners or fathers were present to act as interlocutors. But by the 1760s, it had become widely accepted that scientific study carried the same benefits for individuals of both sexes. As Benjamin Martin claimed in one of his promotional pamphlets for his lectures on the air pump and other instruments, knowledge has now become a fashionable thing, and philosophy is the science a la mode. Hence, to cultivate this study is only to be in taste, and politeness is the inevitable consequence. In circumstances such as those described by Wright in his picture, the discussion of natural laws may not lead to any breakthroughs in human knowledge, but it can help inculcate the virtues of sociability. And maybe that's the most that can be expected of philosophy in a modern commercial society, that together with the other civilized arts such as painting, it may help to refine the human passions into the good manners essential to the creation of social harmony. The air pump identifies the family circle as a mechanism of singular importance to the progress of civilization. From what Wright's image tells us, the home offers not only a place for the development of the, of the mind, 
but also, and perhaps even more crucially, an arena for the cultivation of the heart. This is a process that works over time. While the distress shown by the two young girls may express a perfectly natural sympathy for the bird, their reactions transgress the rules of decorum to which all the older members of the group conform. Self-command comes about through the agency of education or through what may more accurately be termed social commerce, the mimetic exchange of sentiments and opinions that defines the improving function of conversation. The inclusion of a token female presence in a gathering dominated by men aligns Wright's image with numerous mid-18th century moral writers who recommended the mixing of the sexes as a mutually beneficial conjunction. Just give you one quote, one typical example, sort of a maxim. The man not only protects and advises, but communicates vigor and resolution to the woman. She, in her turn, softens, refines, and polishes him. But respectable wives and mothers were actively discouraged from indulging in preoccupations that might distract them from their domestic duties. The omission of the children's mother from the air pump's cast of characters chimes with the advice given in contemporary conduct books, such as Eliza Haywood's The Wife of 1756. Haywood condemns the married woman who allows herself to get carried away by what she says is the madness of natural philosophy. She says, it best becomes her to center her whole studies within the compass of her own, wall, her own walls, to inquire no farther than into the humors and inclinations of her husband and children, to the end that she may know how to oblige those she finds in him and rectify what is amiss in them, and not to extend her speculations beyond her family and those things that are entrusted to her management. Not exactly a feminist statement. It is because the air pump's absent mother has met all these obligations that the table is so brilliantly polished, the children so well presented and so deferential, and her husband such a paragon of paternal benevolence. At the same time, and here I'm talking about father here, his behavior points to the broader to a broader pattern of social amelioration that in these same decades was being hailed by David Hume, Adam Smith, John Miller, and other influential figures in the Scottish School of Moral Philosophy as one of the most praiseworthy consequences of the rise of commerce. In 1771, for instance, Miller would claim that the improvements in the state of society, which are the effects of opulence and refinement, will dispose the father to behave with greater mildness and moderation in the exercise of his authority. As he lives in greater affluence and security, he is at more leisure to exert the social affections and to cultivate those arts which tend to soften and humanize the temper. Being less occupied with the care of his own preservation, he enters with more delicate sensibility into the feelings of others and beholds their distresses and sufferings with greater sorrow and commiseration. In much the same spirit, uh, David Hume was entirely convinced that only in what he called the more polished and luxurious nations would we find industry, knowledge, and humanity forged together into one indissoluble chain the air pump manifests Wright's commitment to this ideology of refinement as much by virtue of the smoothly polished way in which it's painted as through uh, the artist's choice of moral subject matter. One of the key lessons he invited his audience to draw from his painted scene was that their world of greater affluence and security produced individuals capable of virtuous fellow feeling for people and creatures, living creatures besides themselves. Okay. 
Up until this point, I've been describing how the air pump met the central ethical requirement of history painting by presenting its viewers with an example of enlightened behavior uh, designed to inspire their emulation. And because the scene presented an audience of affluent and cultured modern Britons with an image of people just like themselves, one imagines that Wright's picture must have given them the additional satisfaction of confirming their cherished belief in their own fundamental goodness. If the sole purpose of the air pump was to act as, a, if you like, an engine of bourgeois complacency, then I suppose we could simply dismiss it as a sophisticated but fundamentally straightforward piece of flattery. I could end this lecture and we could all go home. But fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how tired or comfortable you're feeling, uh, that's not quite the whole story. Now, you may recall at the beginning of my talk, I spoke of a second type of moral imagery that enjoyed widespread currency in 18th century England. This was graphic satire, which fulfilled its moral role by picturing contemporary conduct that transgressed social norms and that strove, if not always with great seriousness, to elicit a critical reaction from the spectator. The leading British exponent of this genre was William Hogarth, whose extensive oeuvre included a cele particularly celebrated image of a nocturnal social gathering that would have been extremely familiar to Wright and his audience, Midnight Modern Conversation. Now, as you can see, both scenes feature a modern company around a table that bears a large bowl filled with liquid. At the center of each stands a man with one hand upraised, his fingers grasping a glass vessel. Now, though I doubt whether these sim similarities are entirely coincidental, I don't want to overstate their significance. Beyond inferring from their presence that Wright's portrayal of an altogether more respectable ritual of sociability may not be as unequivocally positive as my previous remarks may have uh, led you to believe. So let's look again at the air pump from a slightly different perspective. Even though the arrangement of its figures suggests that they are joined within the encircling bonds of community, there are also signs here that a social order constructed from such highly individualized pieces might easily collapse into nothing more than a jumble of disconnected fragments. The unity we see has been constructed out of difference. As we survey the participants in the scene, we can't help but be struck by the variety of responses displayed to the central object of contemplation and by the fact that all but a few of Wright's actors appear entirely oblivious to the other members of the company. Certainly, the two girls appear much affected by the plight of the struggling bird, and the father by the anxiety of his children. Meanwhile, the young woman looks with some affection towards her husband or lover. But neither this couple nor anyone else, aside from the father, manis manifests any evident concern for the afflicted children or the cockatoo. The sisters enter into the sentiments of the bird by imagining what its feelings might be like. They respond as beholders to a dramatic spectacle of distress, just as we respond to the scene as a whole. From our privileged position in the audience, we can project ourselves into the position of all of Wright's actors, up to and including the poor cockatoo. The highlighting of the nuclear family group draws our attention to this touching motif, and in so doing positions the spectator as a connoisseur, if you like, of admirable but exceptional feelings. But in so doing, Wright also invites us to take pleasure from distress. This may make an important contribution to the education of human sentiments 
as many 18th century moralists would have had their readers believe. Yet the scene that Wright has described can't, cannot help but raise certain ethical doubts. Just how virtuous are the people whom the painter has portrayed? And how virtuous is the world reflected on his canvas? The most obvious answers to these questions hinge on the features that dominate Wright's pyramidal con composition, the glass receiver containing the suffocating bird. I think we can be virtually certain that its treatment would have struck many contemporary viewers as an unnecessary act of cruelty. That the artist was also of this opinion, we can deduce from his quotations from another Hogarth print, the final place plate of the four stages of cruelty. The right-hand boy in the air pump mirrors the pose of the uh, uh, youth on the left side of the Hogarth. The uh, uh, rod in the bell jar and the, uh, uh, echoes the, instruct, uh, the, the instructor's rod uh, in the Hogarth. And we have uh, ropes attached to a pulley uh, in uh, each of the uh, uh, images. If it was Wright's intention, as I uh, believe it was, to raise ethical doubts about the society that condoned such experiments, then his attitude would have been entirely consistent with the views expressed in numerous contemporary texts on popular science. Their authors frequently recommended the use of an inflated bladder or balloon instead of a live animal, so as to avoid causing unnecessary pain both to the creature itself and to the human spectator. And if we are right to identify the cockatoo as the children's pet, as at least one art critic did at the time, then the exploitation of its suffering for the entertainment of an, intim of an intimate sociable gathering becomes even more problematic. David Hume, as I mentioned earlier, had spoken of industry, knowledge, and humanity as an indissoluble chain that could only be created in the circumstances of commercial affluence. But from Wright's picture, it appears that Hume's chain may not be quite so indissoluble after all. Of all the pictures shown attending to the air pump. None is harder to reconcile with the dictates of virtue than the philosopher who conducts the experiment. In demonstrating his expertise for his own profit and for the entertainment of his audience, he also assumes a power of life and death, a power that he cannot control with absolute certainty and that is not rightly his, but God's. The overtly religious character of Wright's image points to a danger for all the viewers within and without the scene. That in pursuing their different interests, they will miss the true purpose of the experiment. Beneath the ritual designed to demonstrate the necessity of air to life lies a deeper spiritual imperative. To make human humankind aware of the supreme wisdom of the divinity to conduct themselves in accordance with his will and in the knowledge that he holds their fate in his hands. The fact that the bird is shown hovering between life and death underlines the transience of all earthly existence. And to drive this point home, Wright has described the murky shape of a decaying skull in the bell jar sitting in the center of the table where it is ignored by all but the oldest member of the company, he who is closest to death. The conjunction of skull, candle, and bubbles, here being released uh, 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 um, by the interaction of, of, of bone with sulfuric acid, functions here as it had long done in the iconography of Dutch art as a sign of the vanity of human pleasures. And what are the principal pleasures on offer in Wright's scene, none other than philosophy, sympathy, and polite conversation. In a prosperous modern commercial society, it would seem that the most civilized and civilizing of human activities and sentiments 
have lost their secure ethical bearings and have taken on the mutable character of mobile forms of property, of refinements that may improve, but that may just as easily corrupt. These misgivings were hardly rights alone. Throughout rec recorded history, Western societies have commonly viewed trading practices as a necessarily evil, requiring strict vigilance, lest the passions stimulated by the pursuit of economic gain destroy the citizen's moral fiber, as well as the very fabric of civilization itself. While 18th century Britain witnessed the rise of a powerful discourse that championed the virtues of a free market governed by private interests, deep anxieties remained, leaving their mark on the air pump and countless other works of art and literature. Wright's borrowing from Hogarth indicate that such concerns could easily have featured in his picture's dialogue with its original audience. But I want to end this talk by suggesting that the image raises another, much darker topic of conversation that almost certainly had to be suppressed in order to preserve the celebratory facade of virtuous conduct that the painter had built with such meticulous care. Earlier this evening, as you may uh, remember, I mentioned that at least two of the commodities on view in the air pump, the cockatoo and the mahogany table, would have originated in the far-flung far -flung corners of the globe, in the East and West Indies, respectively. Both of these objects speak of the vast international trade in raw materials and living creatures that underpinned Britain's commercial prosperity. The piece of furniture crafted out of Honduran or Cuban mahogany and the trafficked bird in its glass prison. Both speak, in other words, of empire and, dare I say it, of slavery. As discomforting as it may be to bring this issue into the picture, I worry that if we leave it out, we run the risk of placing ourselves in a position of complicity with an affluent 18th century citizenry who prided themselves on their industry, sympathy, and humanity, and who may have been quite willing to acknowledge that commercial societies had certain moral shortcomings, but who in the main conveniently overlooked the cruel and humane practices upon which a great proportion of their nation's wealth was based. Art historians have suggested that Wright may have chosen and positioned his white bird with a view to invoking the divine by using a traditional symbol of the Holy Spirit. And this may well have been his intention. But if we are willing to look upwards to the heavens and to celebrate the transcendent qualities of art, shouldn't we also have the bravery to look downwards and confront some uncomfortable truths? Wright himself seems to have been prepared to do so. If not overtly in the air pump, then in another fascinating subject picture, also featuring young girls. He produced this work a couple of years later after he had moved to Liverpool, the most active slaving port in all of Europe. What a conversation of girls has to say about the ethics of slavery is far from clear, in part because all the participants are children. Whether it seeks to naturalize or to criticize a racially based social hierarchy is open to debate, one that I uh, really haven't got the time to engage in here. Personally, I find this image pretty disturbing. And in this, I imagine I'm far from alone. But as we turn our attention back to the air pump, I think we need to ask ourselves if our response to Wright's monumental canvas and to other pictures from the same era, whether that response should also take, into, take account of a shameful chapter in Anglo-American history that has long been kept hidden in the darkness. Maybe that's where our next conversation should begin. Thank you. <laughs>